On the show today, we have Jaime Gomez. He is an actor who's come out on uh, Nash Bridges uh, and Training Day. How are you? I'm doing great. Doing great. How are you doing? Excellent. Excellent. So what what kind of uh, films uh, do you have coming up? Uh, the project that we've been working for the last year and a half um, is a project called Gus. It's about legendary civil rights attorney Gus Garcia, who fought segregation, racism in the 40s and 50s in Texas, and was the first Mexican-American to argue a case on the floor of the Supreme Court and win, literally changing the face of the American justice system. Okay. Did you grow up in L.A.? Uh, I did. Yeah, I grew up about eight miles southeast of downtown L.A. in beautiful Whittier, California, named after John Greenleaf Whittier. (laughs) Cool. And uh, what what was your life like uh, growing up in in that time? Um, I think, you know, our whole our whole devotion was was going to the ocean. You know, we used to ride the bus when I was really young. We'd ride the bus down Beach Boulevard to Huntington Beach, and we got older and got cars. We'd surf before school and after school and head down to Laguna and Oceanside, and that was that was very much the lifestyle. And I thought, you know what, I, I better move out of Whittier. I'm going to end up working at 7-Eleven, surfing <laughs> every other day. <laughs> <That's awesome. laughs> And uh, what what got you into uh, into acting? Like how did, how how did your life go into that? Well, that's that's kind of a funny story. I uh, I went to a Catholic high school uh, in Santa Fe Springs, St. Paul High School, really great football school. And there was an English final that uh, that somehow disappeared, and it got linked to me. So I got kicked out of that class and put into a Shakespeare class. Oh. Fell in love with Shakespeare. Absolutely loved it. The teacher made us, you know, play one of the roles. Um, and then when I went to, I went to a JC to study architecture, and I just didn't, I didn't have the math background. So I was looking through the the manual, and they were doing a principles of acting, and they were doing a scene from Shakespeare. So I did that, and then the teacher asked me to be an extra. They were doing a production of Streetcar Named Desire, and as soon as I was there, when the lights went down and the audience came in. I said, man, this is what I want to do. And it just it just so happened, one of the actors there was studying with a woman named Joanne Barron, who studied with Bill Esper and, um, and Sanford Meisner out of New York. She just came from New York, and she accepted 10 men and 10 women out of thousands of applicants. I think I, I was 19 at the time, and I, I got chosen. And uh, I did a two-year training program, and right out of the school, I started working. Wow. Wow, that's an amazing story. Yeah, it was amazing. And the the great Hollywood story of it is right when I got out of class, I got an agent, and I went to an audition at Paramount for a big studio feature film, and I booked it, my first audition. And I was so excited, I couldn't believe it. I was like, wow, that was easy. <laughs> and then they Usually then it takes they fired, years for that. Right. And then they fired the director and fired the whole cast. Oh, wow. So I was completely over the moon, and then I just got crushed. And then it took me, you know, the customary year to get a really great, great job, you know. <laughs> okay, cool. And yeah. uh, and how was uh, working with uh, Nash Bridges on that on that set? Was it uh, fun? And tell me about it. Yeah, the Nash Bridges show was. Uh, it was a lot like going to film school, you know. When I started, um, I I literally tested at CBS on Saturday. And then I flew out on Sunday, and I was doing a scene with Don Johnson on Monday. That's how fast it happened. And, uh, you know, Don said, figure out what, what everybody does. You're going to have time. Learn how to load film. Learn about lenses, cameras, pre-production, post-production meetings. And, and that's what I did. And it was, it was quite an education. But, you know, mostly with Don and Cheech, we just laughed the whole time. <laughs> did, you smoke, just com- did you smoke weed with Cheech? <laughs> I mean, come on, it's Cheech. How could you not smoke weed with Cheech? I, mean, I would say that's I'll tell yes. you, one of the funny things was uh, they had the first medical marijuana store in San Francisco. And, of course, Cheech was invited. He, he asked me to come along. And I got uh, we got our honorary first marijuana, <laughs> marijuana card. You know, oh, after, that's awesome. I don't even know how to say it. It's a marijuana card, right? Right. To yeah, go the to medical the, card. To the dispensary. Yeah. yeah, the medical card, exactly. But uh, yeah, it was pretty cool, man. It was pretty cool. 
That's cool. And let me ask you this question. Lots of people uh, who, who don't live in Hollywood who are not part of that scene, mm-hmm. they, they perceive people in that, in that kind of scene as liberal or left wing or whatever you want to call it. Sure. What like what what is it about Hollywood that makes people have that pr- particular uh, political viewpoint on the world? What, do you think it's well, the industry, or do you think it's the arts, or what do you think that is? Well, I think it. You know, in my experience, it's both sides. You know, it seems that when you're an artist and you're uh, about you know, trying to be, to live your life in the liberal arts. It's about caring for humanity and caring for others, which is very much the liberal democratic, you know, supposed to be the ideal. And then uh, a lot of, you know, people, when they make a lot of money, they become more conservative, more Republican uh, as as people grow older. But I think, you know, the, the real idea of it is, is that, you know, I've never met an actor or a writer who, wouldn't share what they had with somebody else. And that seems to be, you know, what the democratic ideal is, right? About, uh, you know, helping others more than the Republican Party. And I think that's that's kind of what it comes from. But to be honest with you, I don't know. People who I thought were very liberal weren't. <laughs> really? People who I thought were very, very Republican were the, were the complete opposite. Yeah, so, yeah, the, the, I don't know about the, the stereotype, you know. It, and do you think, I, I'm always surprised. And do you think in Hollywood uh, there's, there's, a, there's a big the, – the people who are conservatives and the people who are liberals, do they hang around or are they, are they kind of like drawing the line on who they hang around with? Oh, no, it's very much it's, – it's a big mishmash, you know, because any way you slice it, it's show business. Okay. And it's about business, and it doesn't matter uh, anybody, the color of their skin, gay, straight, Republican, you know, Democrat. If we have a great show, great content, and we can make money doing it, you know, it seems like, yeah, let's do it. You know, I've, I've never seen anything anything other than that. And so tell me more about this uh, film you're working on. So what, what was the, uh, the lawsuit about? How'd that, how'd that work? Yeah, what happened was is is uh, Gus Garcia was this was this amazing lawyer. Uh, one of the one of the the key things he did was uh, it's called Bastrop v uh, the Board of Education, where they considered the Mexican children uh, not as smart as the uh, they couldn't learn as well as the white kids. So he actually came out here to California to Westminster, and he brought this little Mexican girl, um, uh, brought her to court, and she was so well spoken and so eloquent in English and Spanish, and could quote Latin from the Bible, that he just completely blew up that ideal that there was pedagogical differences between races, right? Mm-hmm. So that opened the door for the desegregation of the schools in California and in texas and that really opened the eyes to everybody uh thurgood marshall was one of his buddies so that helped to be one of the building blocks for brown v the board of education the landmark thurgood marshall case um so he he found a guy who killed somebody and the guy got the death penalty a little mexican farm worker guy with a club foot that nobody liked and he took this case all the way to the supreme court because only white males were allowed on the juries and he fought to have minorities and women uh on the juries because in all the years in the history of texas there hadn't been one mexican american that sat on the jury so if you can't be tried by a jury of your peers that's illegal it's against the 14th amendment right so they took this fight like i said all the way to the supreme court and he ended up uh with this amazing, eloquent argument, and uh, uh, the Supreme Court justice there actually gave him more time to argue his case, which has never been done since or before, and uh, he nailed it, and it passed. It uh, It was a landmark case that allowed women and minorities to sit on on juries. Now, this case came out, and it was overshadowed because Thurgood Marshall's case came out that desegregated schools in the South. And uh, it kind of took the headlines away from uh, from Gus Garcia and his his troop of guys, but nevertheless, it was uh, it was a landmark case in the history of 
of Mexican American culture, but all of the minority cultures, which was kind of kind of a cool thing. And he never really got the the accolades that he deserved. And he he fought his whole life for everybody else, but he couldn't fight his own inner demons. And he ended up succumbing to uh, what doing history and the research. I think he is probably bipolar. Oh. But in those days, they dealt with it. You know, he dealt with his self-medication with alcohol. And when he he actually committed himself on two occasions and uh, got shock treatment, which didn't help. Um, he helped get the Kennedys elected with his Viva Kennedy campaign. And he had a place in the administration. And he just couldn't get out of his own way. And he ended up dying penniless oh, and alone on a park bench in San Antonio, Texas. Wow, that's an that's an interesting story. That's, that's amazing a, story. It's like it really is like a Greek tragedy. You know, somebody who had it all and could do it all, but there was something. You know, he had uh, a little imbalance in his head, and he just he couldn't uh, he couldn't do it for himself. Hmm. Going back to what you said earlier about uh, so the argument in uh, in the case was. If, if you're not of the same racial background as someone else, you can't be judged uh, by your peers. Is that kind of like what the argument kind of is? Yeah, it was kind of if, if the, the real basis was that if I grew up the same way that the guy committed the, who committed the crime did, I could be empathetic to him. I see. That, you know, if I grew up with an alcoholic father, you know, picking cotton 12 hours a day because I'm Mexican-American, mm -hmm. then maybe I can be empathetic that this poor guy, the, the poor guy, he had a club foot. Everybody hated him. His father hated him. He walked, you know, 10 miles a day to, to you know, pick cotton for 30 cents a day. And he was just got in an argument. It was an accident, you know, that he, he killed this guy. And if you're not, if you don't have empathy for that because you've never lived that kind of life, of course you're just going to give everybody and their brother the death penalty left and right because you can't see that, you know, maybe this guy had a hard life and he deserves, you know, maybe life in prison or whatever. You know? Right. So it's kind of like the wives who kill their husbands and they're usually given a lesser sentence because they, they make a case that they were abused. Right, right. You know, and uh, a woman's point of view is different than a man's point of view, especially if a woman has, you know, dealt with an abusive, you know, spouse, whoever it may be, or father or brother or boyfriend, whatever, you know. And so yeah. in, in the movie, who do you play? Uh, well, my goal and the reason that I developed and put it together is to play the role of Gus Garcia. Wow. Um, it was really cool that we did. Uh, I went to San Antonio, Texas. Uh, I shot a little three minute teaser and I screened it in Laredo where he was from. And I got to meet his, his niece and she had tears in her eyes because believe it or not, we actually look exactly alike. He had blue eyes. I have brown eyes. But we look a lot alike. And she said, man, she goes, this story really needs to be told. And, uh, you know, you look just like Gus Garcia. But, you know, in all honesty, he was better looking than you. <laughs> 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 the sweet little little old lady. She was so, so kind. It's, but, yeah, you know, it's, it's a, a powerful story. story. It yeah, is a powerful, powerful story. Yeah. And that's where my family is from. My family's from uh, McAllen, Texas. Oh. And they experienced, uh, experienced a lot of racism and you know, my, my grandparents that were there and great grandparents, they were there when, you know, when Texas was owned by the Spaniards and by the French and when it was its own country. So they've been there for hundreds of years. And, uh, you know, they experienced a lot of, of the racism that Gus Garcia was fighting against, you know, so it's kind of gone full circle. So it's really cool. And, you know, the, my biggest idea about it, the biggest you know, theme thematically is that it's an important story because here's a guy, 100% Mexican American, who spoke perfect English, who graduated at the top of his class and did amazing things. And as an actor who's been doing it uh, for a long time here in Hollywood, you know, just last uh, on Thursday, I got a, a great audition for for um, uh, the show that shoots in Hawaii, Magnum. Yeah, and the guy's a drug dealer, and the whole role is all in Spanish. And I said, "No thanks." They said, "Oh well, we have something else for you—another big TV show." 
two farm workers and another cartel killer, all in Spanish. And I said, you know, this is why I'm trying to develop the Gus movie. This is why I'm looking for people to help me, you know, get this thing up on the screen. Because uh, stereotypes are what kill us all in the end, you know. If, um, if you as a writer, as a producer, as a creator of a TV series, if the only Latino people or black people or Asian people that you meet are, you know, are the gardener or are the cook or is an athlete, then you can't write or do anything else. So this film isn't just for the Latino people, you know, let's say. It's just a, it's a commonality that we all have together that, uh, you know, people of all colors and all stripes are educated, are integrally important uh, in the fabric of America, you know, and, what, and that's, that's the idea we're putting across. And what do you say to those people uh, that say stereotypes have a level of truth in them? And not only that, when they're, when they're filmed in that way, it makes the movie uh, more, I don't know, sensational. Well, I agree with you. You know, there's stereotypes for a reason. You know, there are stereotypes for a reason, but also if you only give voice to a certain kind of ter- stereotype and not look at the, you know, totality of, of uh, culture's contribution, then that on its own is, is kind of being exclusionary. Sure, you know, there are stereotypes. I agree with you 100%. There are farm workers. And, you know, if that was where my head was at, uh, I think somebody should play that role and play it brilliantly, you know, but that's not where I'm at. You know, I, I played a farm worker. I played the cartel killer. I want to do something more. You know, that's just, it's a personal choice. Well, in, I'm, not, uh, in tra- I'm not frowning on the other thing at all. You know? Well, in uh, training day, you also played kind of like a, a drug dealer killer. Excuse me? I was a cop. no that's exactly right and that's you know that's a big part of it there are bad cops you know there are bad cops too right there are good cops and there are bad cops and uh you know i think not all well well well, well, i mm -hmm, mean the the cop the cop in that movie was a was in a way kind of like a killer and kind of of absolutely right right yeah totally bad cop but i don't think that every cop should be portrayed as a bad cop you know there are there are great cops you know one of my one of my you know mentors growing up was uh, richard dominguez who was the father of my best friend he was a lapd detective and he was just you know a man amongst men such a great guy kind guy and did everything by the book you know and uh you know here's a funny thing that uh, fact that people don't know that cheech cheech is father i want to say his father or his uncle was the highest ranking latino officer in the lapd at that time in the 50s so he has a long history of policemen in his his family too which was kind of interesting you you wouldn't expect that from uh (laughs) (laughs) right but um but like uh, in the movie when the uh, training day, for example, was, mm-hmm. was being filmed, uh, and you know they, they they had you there, and the, and the movie is really about bad cops. That sure. st- that stereotype of of L.A. In, in a sense, at that around that time, there was uh, the Rampart uh, debacle, right. as they call it. Yeah, right. Yeah, that's what it was based on. I I can't remember that cop, and I think that that goes all the way. That runs really deep in the history and the culture of Los Angeles. It's uh, it's almost like a Chinatown, you know, right. how bad those cops were in stealing and killing. And, um, yeah, the LAPD has had a really storied history, both both good and bad. And uh, and I think that was that was really an amazing film. And and one of the cool things I got to do was I got to read with Denzel. Uh, I read the part that Ethan Hawke played with him. And we read the script from beginning to end because they did a computer animation of the, of the, because uh, the, the, the movie takes place over the course of a day. Yeah. So every single shot as the script progresses, the sun had to be in a, in a certain place. I never thought right? of that. Yeah. So it was very, very site specific. So I had that opportunity to sit down with him and the director and we read it from beginning to end, and then they did storyboards on the computer 
to have the gradient of light as it went through. I learned a lot. I learned a lot making that film. Uh, I personally and, think uh, you should have done uh, Ethan Hawke's uh, part, honestly. I think it would have been more realistic. <laughs> from from your lips to God's ears. Yeah, you know? I think it would have been a lot better. <laughs> the, uh, that was actually the second movie. I, I did uh, Crimson Tide with Denzel, too. So that was kind of a kind of a cool thing. How, you know, how is it I, working with uh, Denzel Washington? It's just uh, you know he's he's Denzel Washington for a reason, you know, and that's what I tried to pattern everything I've ever done, you know. After him, is he's a guy that shows up on time, he shows up prepared, and he's he's ready to work and he's ready to knock it out of the park on the first take. You know? Yeah, one thing I, I read about him is that he's very religious, personally. Mm. I didn't know that, but I read that he was a very religious yeah. person. But yeah, I knew he was a he's a Christian guy, but it, it, he doesn't. That's not something he brings. Well, to work right. He doesn't bring that. To yeah, work. because we everything he does, the time I got to spend with him, it's about doing the work. There's no joking around. It's not you know, hey, what'd you have for dinner last night? It's like, okay, we're ready to work. What are we doing here? Right. You know, and it shows in his work. You know, it really does. And uh, yeah, as a person who lives in Hollywood, worked in Hollywood, been around L.A. for a long time, let me ask you this controversial question. Do mm -hmm. you think Donald Trump is a racist? Um, I'd have to say, yeah. You know, I think that's his, that's his, uh, that's his point of view. You know, I think the the policies are, are skewed towards uh, being, you know, anti anti anybody who's not white. And I just I, I, the thing I find most I don't know if amusing is the right word. It's you know Donald Trump and his family they're immigrants. You know that's the thing I don't understand. Well, I just don't get right? it. Yeah, they're all immigrants. Everybody is here unless you're Native American. That's that's the part I don't get. You know, I really don't get, but, um, you know, I think there's, uh, there's a big reckoning coming, you know, in the ballot box and it, it's going to go either way, right? Either America's going to say, yeah, this is who we are or, or, you know, America's going to vote them out. So it's definitely going to be interesting. Yeah. It's, uh, it's, I think it's polarized a lot of people in the country. I think it's made, uh, people really angry uh towards each other when they have different political views uh, uh so yeah yeah so, so i wonder what it what's like to live in hollywood where, where all this division's going on yeah a lot of people are you know it's uh, it's like a perfect example on twitter you know that's why i left twitter because the venom and vitriol is so over the top it's unhealthy you know, people that uh, I consider good people are supporters of Trump, and people who I consider good people are completely anti-Trump to the point of of it's it's not pretty on either side of the coin. You know what I mean? It's uh, so I try, I, I try I, to stay away from Twitter too because I think it it, it lends itself to like you know uh, vitriol, like you said. Yeah, and it, and it, you're just kind of. You're screaming into the ether, you know. You're venting frustration into the into the Twitterverse <laughs> uh, instead of trying to do something about it. You know what I mean? I mean that's that's how I feel. That's that's my feel. It's I think the energy that we exude is in for me. I try to exude it in a positive way and and do positive things. Um, and it just, it's just too over the top negative, you know, when I'm commenting to Lindsey Graham, who I, I doubt ever is going to respond to my, <laughs> to my tweet. It's like, what am I doing? <laughs> you know, what am I doing? Right. You're just kind of responding to an avatar, you know, that that's right. like, has his name on it. You know, it's like a right. symbol and of him. Yeah. And it's like, you know, do I, does it make me feel better? Not really. Does it elicit change? Not really, you know, so I just, I chose to bow out and I'm just going to try to live in the real world. <laughs> and it, and it's strange because when Donald Trump, uh, before he was elected, um, you know, he was, uh, he was involved in a lot of, uh, you know, with a lot of groups and people who were diverse and uh, he had the hit show and everybody loved the show. And all of a sudden when he became president, 
I feel like the the lines were were divided. I don't I don't know what happened honestly between the, before that and after that that made everyone kind of um, hate them in a way. Yeah, I think too. You know, my my big take on on Trump and the, everything that he's doing, it's all about big business and it's about making money. You know, the Republican Party deregul deregulation regulation. It's all about making money. The more, if you can pollute more, you can make more money. If you can use, you know, pesticides that we've already, they've already created, they don't have to design, you know, eco safe ones, you know? So it's all about the almighty dollar, you know, in my opinion. And I think that's where Donald Trump sees, they see him as a savior and they don't care what he says or what he does because the donors, are um uh, they're getting they're getting their pound of flesh for their contribution to the republican party and you what, know because mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. go ahead well what, what do you say about uh uh for example hispanic americans or black americans or asian americans who are trump supporters who jo or who join trump and they're ardent supporters do you do you think they're um what do you think about them you know, it's, it, it, I just think, I think it's, it's odd, <laughs> you know, but I'm very much believe that it's their absolute right to support who they want to support. You know, a lot of people I know attack those kind of people and, uh, and, you know, tell them that they're traitors and that they're a traitor to their race. But, you know, I really do believe in this in the ideals of this country that, Hey, you, you support who you want to support, you know? And I think the, the, the bottom line is when less than 50% of the population votes, that's the problem. You know, that's, that to me is the problem. Um, if, if, you know, you want to vote for Donald Trump, that's your prerogative, you know? That's how I feel about it. It's unfortunate, but that's the truth. So you're saying that you know? if more, if more, there's more voter participation, maybe the outcome would be different. I think so. You know, I think so. And, and is it is that the reason why you know the public schools are so bad because they don't want people to vote. They rather have people watching nine hours of football on Sunday. <laughs> yeah, you well, know, and watching Sports Center day and night instead of getting educated on the on the you know civil the civil laws that affect our children and affect us on a day to day level. Yeah, I've, know, always, I've always wondered why on voting day um, there, there couldn't be a holiday called voting day and everyone has a day off to go and vote. I've always yeah. noticed it's on like a Tuesday or Wednesday on working right. hours. Why isn't everybody registered when you're born? Oh, that's a great, that's a great point. Yeah, why isn't it, you know, why do they make it difficult to vote? You know, I don't, it's, it's, the idea of manifest destiny is, is deeply ingrained in the American power culture and always has been. What is you that, know? is that like the secret, like uh, the book, The Secret, where you kind of manifest reality by, by thinking a certain way? Well, I think, you know, like the genocide of the Native Americans, you oh, know, oh, they, they justified it by saying, hey, we're a country and we're growing. So we're going to exterminate this, these people, you know, it's our destiny to to be from shore to shore. And if you're in the way, you know, that's progress, you know, that's progress. And it's kind of that's that's what I see. That's the idea of, of big business where, hey. You know, we're going to do what it's we have like to do. It's kind of like capitalism. Yeah, it's, it's capitalism run, run amok, you know. And, uh, uh, you know, I'm not a supporter of, of uh, you know. Communism. Uh, yeah, communism, you know, socialism like they have. But, you know, we live in a socialistic de democracy. You know, people have pension plans. They do get health care. You know, so there's, there's a lot of room for improvement. And, you know, I'm confident that, you know, that positive change can happen and it can happen by people getting engaged and, uh, and voting. Thank you for being on the show. And, uh, where can more uh, people find out more information about the projects you're working on? Um, at the moment, you know, you can follow me on Facebook at Jaime P. Gomez. That's kind of my, uh, that's our fan page. Um, there's some, announcements going to be coming soon you know we're trying to put together the website and 
you know, uh, there's the big Nash revival that's coming up uh, that, you know, I don't know if I'm going to be a part of that, but there's a lot of good things coming, but, you know, check me out on Facebook and, and we'll go from there. Well, yeah. thank you for being on the show, uh, Jaime Gomez. My pleasure, Evan. Have a great day.